here today. Anyone that listens to this through Facebook or YouTube or whatever platform this reaches you at, I'm glad that you're with us as well. This is for you. Just to share some of my thoughts with you from this week. I'm going to talk to you today about the function, the function and the foundation of a father and a family. I have been talking to you that we are a spiritual family, and I talk to you in the terms of being a household of faith. This is instrumental because when the apostles went about, they not only established the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. <coughs> Jesus is the builder of the church. I need you to understand that the apostles went about as spiritual fathers establishing households of faith. I need you to understand that there is a way in which a father is to function and how the family is to function. I need you to understand that there is a foundation that needs to be in a father and there is a foundation that needs to be in a family. So stay with me in this. One thing that I have found, no matter who they are in this world, is that everyone wants to be where they matter. Everyone wants to be where they matter. <coughs> Everybody. You want to feel that you matter to somebody, whether it's a friend, a family. So I'm going to address some things. Some of these things may touch some near places in your heart. You may have grown up feeling like that you didn't matter. I felt that way many times. I can identify. There may be times now in your life that you feel like that your existence doesn't matter. What am I here for? What am I doing? Sometimes you may be wondering whether you are here or not. Does it really matter? It does matter. I just talked to you about fellowship. I just talked to you about the koinonia, the communion, the fellowship that they had as far as the four pillars. You may feel like whether you're here on the earth or not, does it really matter? All of you may think this at different times. Sometimes you may feel like you're filled with purpose. Sometimes you may feel like you are you know, walking towards your destiny, and the next day you may feel like, why am I even here? What am I doing? I believe that probably every person at some point in their life has at, on some day if you've been here long enough, you may have even contemplated suicide. You may have thought, I don't really matter. What does my life really matter? If I'm not here, is it going to make any difference? Let me say this to you. Because you are God's creation, you matter. And because God created you, he created you with a purpose. And because of that purpose, you matter. God could have prevented your existence, but he didn't. Because he formed you. He created you. And he didn't create you just to exist. And he didn't create you to just be an existence of matter. He created you to have an identity. <coughs> and God wants you to be able to find that identity and that identity, I can find all through Scripture that identity is found in a family. This is why young men run our streets and they'll join a gang because they're looking for a family. Yeah. It doesn't matter even if they're part of a drug cartel. There's always somebody who's at the top of that family. Yeah. The mafia even understood this. Yeah. They had father, a godfather, 
They call it a family. You ever notice that? Yep. The Godfather calls it his family. They have the sense that here is where I find my identity. This is where I find my idea of importance. Please understand what I'm saying to you. Listen to me back here, guys. You really need to catch this. Because you can, you can spend your whole time in life here, grow up and leave this place, and not know who you are. You could grow up in my household, leave my home at 18 years old, and not know who you are. This is where you will find the idea of your importance. You will not find it in the world. People may think, well, if I go out and I get this education and I get this job and I get this degree, maybe that will make me important. You know, you could become the president of the United States. That may mean that you are important to many people, but you still may not have the idea of importance on the inside of you. Some people are simply trying to climb a mountain in order that they may feel important. But they still may not know where they belong. This is where you find your sense of belonging. This is why God created the family. Because God knew that when he created the family, that a person would find their sense of belonging. This is where I belong. This is my tribe. These are my people. Israel, that's, that's why everywhere that the nation of Israel went, they were a threat to whatever nation they were in. Why? Because they never broke from that identity. And when they did break from that, that identity, they were always overcome. This is what the book of Ezra, he's dealing with. He said, you, you've married foreign women. And because of this, you're going to have ideals and a culture and a mind. Your children are not going to think like the children of Israel. Are you all following me? A family has culture. A family has ideas. A family gives you a sense of belonging. This is where you fit in. This is where you this is where you find your identity. I can remember this. When I first got born again, this was the biggest question in my mind. When I started going to church, I thought, are they going to receive me? Because I don't feel like I fit in there. I don't look like them. I don't talk like them. I had long hair. I had all, all of my clothes in my closet were black. I didn't run with church people. I didn't run with Christian people. I didn't identify them. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, I understood that I was going to have to find a new place of belonging and a new place to identify with. And I wasn't sure if I was going to... I wasn't sure if... if God's people were going to receive me because I look different, sound different. There's going to be times that you may feel like you don't fit in. You may feel like you are not accepted. Let me tell you this. When you are part of a household of faith, when you are part of a family, there may be times when you feel like you don't fit in. There may be times when you feel like I'm not accepted. There may be times when you feel like you're not loved by everybody in the family. How many of you know if you have a natural family, you can identify with this? You may feel like everybody in my family don't love me. Everybody in my family don't treat me the same. Listen, I'm part of a, I'm part of a larger spiritual family. And I'm not sure of everybody's feelings of me. Some may love me. Some may like me. Some may not can stand me. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. That's where I belong. That's where I fit in. That's where I find my belonging. That's where I find my identity. Why? Because God sets the solitary in families. That's what the scripture says. God sets you in a family. He sets you in a family in order that you can find your, your sense of importance. That you do matter. You matter. You are very important. If you weren't this important, Jesus would not have come here and left the Father in order to die for you. That's how important that he would leave the very realm of heaven to come for you. 
So we have to understand that a family structure and order within a family is always, it should be arranged by the father. And then it is nurtured and undergirded by the mother. So the two main primary functions of a family is a father and a mother. I've watched over time, you know, and many of you can probably identify with this. You may have had grandparents or great grandparents. And when they pass away, a lot of times the structure of that family changes. People don't get together the same that they used to because mom and dad are gone. Those people were the glue that, that brought everybody together. And when they're gone, then it, it kind of wanes. Some may stay in touch or whatever. But the a structure and the order of a family is to be arranged by the father and then nurtured and undergirded by the mother. A natural family may fail you. Listen to me very closely. Because this is the season that God is moving his people into. You've got to get out of the mentality of being a church attender and knowing that you're part of a family. That's the change and the transfer that's happening. I don't go to church. I go to gather with my family. We have a family reunion here every Sunday. This isn't just a family reunion church, but this is where we, we develop in our belonging, our identity. This is where you find you may go to your job and feel like you don't fit in there. This is where you fit in. And many times you have to find your place of fitting. You have to find your place of fitting. Where, what is, where do I fit in here? There's many people, when they walk in, they want to know. That's the first thing they want. Where do I fit in? Well, just give it some time and you will find where you fit in. Your natural family may have failed you. Or you may have had a, you may have had a great family experience. I don't know. But I know this. In today's culture, in today's society, the one that we live in right now, that the family is dysfunctional. And it is epidemic. Yeah. The dysfunction of families is epidemic. And the only place that this is ever going to be changed is right here. The government's not going to change it. The school system's not going to change it. The county council's not going to change it. No one in politics can change this. The president can't change it. The Congress can't change it. No one can change this. No one can change the situation that is going on in the family except the household of faith. We have to begin to emulate and model the family in the earth. If the family is ever going to be restored, it's going to happen here first. It has to happen here first. Because there are many people who do not have the correct sense and information of what a family is. Their, their picture of family is that of dysfunction. We have to begin to model a functioning family. And in order to have a functioning family, we have to have the function of a father in place. Malachi chapter 4, please read this with me. Verses 5 and 6. What did God say he was going to do? He said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. You know, I'm really tired of hearing all these things prophesied to people. I want to hear what the spirit of Elijah is saying in this day. And he says, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, this is what he's going to do. The spirit, when the spirit of Elijah comes upon the church, the spirit of Elijah is going to change from a church mentality to a household mentality. A true prophet is going to birth this, not just the idea and the concept of it, but he's going to speak in this way. He will turn the hearts of fathers to children. He will turn the hearts of fathers to to children and the heart of children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse this is the last words that God said in the Old Testament the, the spirit of Elijah Elijah is coming and what's he going to do he's going to cause a turn he's going to cause a return he's going to cause a renewal he's going to cause a restoring a restoring of what that first restoring is going to be that of the mentality of a father. The function of a father. The foundation of a father. This is what we see all modeled through the New Testament. Paul never addressed those that followed him as his disciples. He called them his sons in the Lord. 
Timothy has called his son in the faith. Titus has called his son in the faith. Onesimus has called his son in the faith. When we get to the book of Peter, we can see that Peter calls Mark his son in the faith. When we go to John, we see that John says, I have no greater joy than that my children walk in truth. Yes. And then he calls Gaius his son. This is how they thought. This is how the early church thought. They thought in the function of a family. And they thought in the function of a father first. Because they knew that God said, if a father, if there's not a father's heart, if the father's heart is not found in his family, then what is that family? We have to be found with the father's heart. Jesus had the, the heart of the father. Not only did he have the heart of the father, he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. We have to become those who model sonship in the earth and that of a family. From the very beginning, this has all been about that God wanted a family. That's why he, when he saw the earth was out of order, he sowed his son into the earth that he might reap a family. When Jesus came, he didn't come to just save sinners. He came in order that he might bring many sons. You better read the book of Hebrews and see what he says. That he might bring many sons under the captain of their salvation. So there seems to be no cure in our society for the dysfunction that's going on. Because all the dysfunction is going to do is breed more dysfunction. There's going to be a lot of people that search for answers. But the majority of people are just accepting the dysfunction as a normal way of life. This is how it is. I don't. I don't receive that this is just how it is. What's going to happen? What is happening now and what's going to continue to happen in the future? is we're going to see the function and foundation of a father return. And it must return. If it does not return without the function of, of fathers, we are doomed to repeat the incomplete pattern of the family. Listen to what I'm telling you. If we do not return to the function, now this is important to, to every male child in this place, Women, I'm not excluding you. I'm going to get to you in just a minute. Just wait with me. We know that God set the man to be the head of the house. Statistics will show you that if a man gets saved, if he truly gets born again, that 93% of the families, the rest of the family will follow him. If the mother gets saved and the father doesn't, only 17% of the family will follow that's a tremendous. Why? Because he sets the standard. He sets the structure. He sets the order. Our society is doomed to repeat the same incomplete pattern of a family. We become to where we believe that it's normal now to have single parent homes. I understand that things happen. Yes, they do. They happen. But that does not mean that it's right. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. As great as a mother is, because for the majority of single, for the majority of single uh, parent homes, it's typically the mother that has the children. Sometimes it's the father. I know I ain't trying to get into all of that. But as great as a mother is, she alone cannot bring all of the capacities, the capabilities, and the components that a father will bring and was intended to bring. Because right. God said it in his word. He said, fathers, bring up your children in the Lord. He didn't say mothers. Mm -hmm. All of the responsibility of the father, all of the responsibility falls on the father. When God says that he's going to address your family, he always goes to the fathers. When God said that, that he, was going to, when he was going to address Abraham, he went to Abraham and not Sarah. The head of the family was the father. This is a huge responsibility. What I'm saying to you is that the concept of a father has been lost. The concept of father has been lost. The whole society makes fun of the father. Watch any television show, and the father is always the dumbest and the butt of all the jokes. 
Family guy. Look at him. I mean, what, what is this? Bart Simpson and all. It's, it's, the whole society has no concept of what a father is. And if they do, they may not understand what a father is. You, your father may have been a drunk. Your father may have been a drug addict. Your father may have been, you know, Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. That's the concept that we have of a father. What's got to happen here? God says that he has to turn the heart. He's got to turn the heart of the father. He's got to turn the heart. God's going, you better hear what I'm telling you. God is going to turn the hearts of fathers. Amen. This isn't going to be a revival of men. This is going to be the returning of their hearts. Not to just be a man. What we have in our society is we have sperm donors and we don't have men. That's right. We don't have fathers. Any man can have a child, but not any man can be a father. That's true. Just because you have children, you better listen to me. Just because you have children doesn't mean you're a father. We have a fatherless generation. And what has this led to? We now have a generation of orphan-minded people. The Bible only uses the word orphan twice. The majority of the time it uses the word fatherless. James, when he said, if a man's religion is pure, let him visit the fatherless and the widow. He didn't say orphan, he said fatherless. You've probably heard it quoted over and over. Go to the orphans. It's go to the fatherless. Who are we being sent to? The fatherless? How did we miss that? Because we didn't see that the orphan mind is related to being fatherless. You have to understand and understand this, that God gave the father. You may have grown up with an improper father. I'm sorry that that has happened to you. I understand. But you also need to know that not all fathers are perfect. And the older that you get, the more that you will understand that. My father was in no way perfect. But he did the best with what he knew how. And that's the way I look at him now. But I have to understand that now on my shoulders falls not only the responsibility for me to father natural children, but now that I have been put into a place in the body of Christ that God has said, I want you to father people who have no concept of father. And maybe you do have a concept of father. But I will tell you this. When someone is motherless, that does not mean that they're orphaned. It's when they're fatherless. What does this do? An incomplete mind. A father, if you do not have a proper father, you will have an incomplete mind towards authority. That is right. And when you have an incomplete mind about authority, you will wind up faithless. You always have to put these two in congruent together. I don't want to preach to y'all. I want to talk to you. Listen to me. If you don't understand authority, you will not be able to walk in faith. Jesus confirmed that to the Roman centurion. He said, I haven't seen such great faith. Why? Because this man understood the chains of authority. He understood the structure of authority. He said, I can say to this person, go, and they go. And he said, I'm a man under authority. Why? It takes, it takes faith to receive authority. You have to have somebody over you in the Lord. It takes faith to receive. Y'all have got to hear that. You, you've, got, you've got to hear that. What's needed? What's going to be needed in this day? I'm going to move very quickly here. Stay with me. There's going to be a reformation of fathers. There's going to be a res restoration. There's going to be a reformation of fathers, a restoration of the concept of a family, and there's going to be in God's people the renewal of the image of a son and a daughter. So you don't identify yourself. It, it, here's the problem that we have in the, the larger body of Christ. People will say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Did you catch that? I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's how they've identified themselves. That I'm a survivor. I survived because what Jesus did. That's not the right mentality. You may say, well, I'm just, I'm thankful 
to be part of the kingdom, how may I serve God? You still don't have the right mentality. You have a servant's mentality. That's the serv That's the, the mindset of the prodigal son. He said, I will go back and I will be like one of my father's servants. But you don't realize that that's not the mentality that God wants you to have. Because when he showed up, God didn't make him a servant. The father said, kill the fatted calf. My son has come home. He put on him a ring, a robe, and a pair of sandals. Why is this? Man, I need a dry erase marker maybe. But Can you follow me, Philip, with this? We need to understand that when I'm talking about fellowship, you have to understand the cycles in which we fellowship in this life. We will have friends, but more importantly, we have family. What happens, what do we watch as we raise children? We watch the course of influence shift in many children's lives. When they're young, I bet 50 times a day, my youngest one tells me, I love you, Daddy. Zebby, he just loves me. He gets in my chair every morning and just squeezes me and says, I love you. I love you. I love you. And he just, he'll ride by me on his bicycle. I love you, Daddy. As they grow older, they, they begin to become a little more independent and maybe telling Mom and Dad is, you know, they feel kind of uncomfortable saying, I love you. There's things that shift as they get older. The shift of influence will change. And many times, I didn't say all, but many times, the friends begin to have more influence than the family does. Why? Why? Because God gives us people that we can bond with. Friends can make you or break you. In fellowship, we have what's called a bond. Something that brings us together. I hope you have friends, but I hope you have family. See, a lot of times what people begin to do is they begin to identify themselves over here and not here. That's the wrong order. Why? Because here you were meant to have communion. You have a common union. Over here you just have commonalities. You have things in common. Most of you that you have a friend, you have something in common with them, right? You may like the same, I don't know, whatever. You might like the same cookies. I don't know what it is. What's the difference in family and friends? The difference in family is this is where you find out who you are. Over here, this is what you enjoy. What you enjoy. Why am I talking about all this? Because when God, when God sent the earth, when he saw the earth was out of order and he sent his son into the earth, he sowed his son into the earth that he would reap a family. Why? Because it's in a family that you find out who you are. It's not with your friends that you find out who you are. You will never find out who you are with your friends. Some of you are questioning that in your minds. You may say, well, I identify more with my friends than I do my, with my family. That's not God's order. You're going to wind up with a wrong identity. That's right. Because they will have sway and influence on you that will make you very much unlike your family. 
tomorrow, we might have a problem later. What will begin to happen? When they begin to identify with their friends, they will not identify with their family, and there will be friction in the family. Why is this? This is where you are supposed to relate. This is where you regard. In other words, you'll have respect. Jesus said this. He said if a friend comes knocking at your door late at night, he said you may not want to get out of the bed and answer, but because of their, they are your friend, you will have regard to them. In a family, you are to relate, and that's why you're called a relative. You're a relative. How is it that the body of Christ emulates all of this? Well, it's very common among us that we call each other brother, sister. But now we're starting to talk in a whole different term. Father and mother. This is you, you can't have a house. When there's a house just full of brothers and sisters, you're going to have a mess. If I leave the house and it's all just my sons, it doesn't take very long. That will be a mess. And it's not that, that they are trying to. It's because there's not the sense of authority. You know why? Because if I leave one son in charge, another son will say, well, you ain't daddy. You ain't mama. Is this true? In other words, he's saying, you can't correct me because you don't have the authority to. And I have to explain to my other sons, I left him in charge. Whatever he said to do, that's what you do. Because I'm going to leave the most responsible one in charge. But as soon as dad walks in the house, everything changes, right? Mm -hmm. I can drive up in the yard and hear, going on in the house. The door opens, I open the door and I'm like, What's going on in here? Nothing. Oh, so y'all just all just sitting here. All quiet and peaceful and nice like. They freeze when authority comes in. Why? Because they believe that dad's not going to sit idle. He has the authority here. See, they, the New Testament under church, they understood this. That you have to have father and mother. This is why I believe that the apostles and the prophets emulate mother and father. He said in the church, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, he said in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. How is the structure of the home? Father and mother. It's all through scripture. Ephesians 2 and 20 tells us that the foundation of God's house the foundation of God's house is the apostles and the prophets, Jesus being the chief cornerstone. It's a house. It's a house. It's a house. It's not an institution. It is a house. Jesus, listen, look at Matthew 12 with me real quick. Jesus completely rewrote the concept of family. I got a big green arrow pointing to this in my Bible. That big old green arrow I put in there. Why? The true family of Jesus. While Jesus was yet talking to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren, they stood outside. Sometimes your natural family is not going to come in to where you are. And they desire to speak with him. You know, your family always got something they want to say to you. Then one said to him, behold, your mother and your brethren, they're outside desiring to speak with you. Jesus answered and he said to them, who is my mother? Now I'm sure that they probably looked at Jesus like he was crazy. Because if my mama pulled up out here and y'all said, hey, Todd, your mama's outside and she wants to talk with you. And I said, who's my mama? Y'all would be thinking I haven't entered into dementia or Alzheimer's or something was wrong with my brain. And then he says, who's my brothers? Is Jesus forgetful here? 
Has Jesus got a, a, a loss of short-term memory? What did Jesus do? He stretched forth his hand toward the disciples. And what did he say? Behold, my mother and my brethren. He just completely rocked the whole synagogue. He just rocked everything. He rocked, he rocked the religious system. Because the religious system was all based on a hierarchy of priests and Pharisees and Sadducees and the Herodians and rabbis. And he said, do you see what Jesus is doing here? He's not creating a religious system. He's creating a family. This is my family. Here's my mother and brothers. Whosoever, what does he say in verse 50? This is the most important part of it. Whoever shall do the will of who? My father, my father which is in heaven. The same as my brother, sister, and mother. Jesus just completely rewrote the concept of a family. When we are born again, you have to understand that we are born into a different family. It is a spiritual family. And within the foundation of that family and all of its components, all of the components, listen to me very closely, all of the components within the family of God, they are here to raise us into maturity to be full-grown, healthy, functional, and fit as the sons of God if, if, if we will access all that's available to us. The church has not accessed what's available to us. What is available to us? The mentality of family. The mentality of son. Lord, this is the entire New Testament Christian faith. What is that? Father and son. Father and son. Jesus did. He talked about father and son. Father, I'm the son. I'm the son of man. I'm the son of God. It was father and son. He talked about my father. If you'll pray to my father. If you'll ask the father in my name. He's always talking about father. He's not talking about religion. He doesn't even call God by any other name except father. It's the concept of father. That's the rudiments of, the, of the, all Christianity. That's the foundation. That's the elements of this faith. This is not religious practices. This is a family. This is not about religious practices. This is the hardest thing to get people through right here. Listen to me, Rick. Put all your focus and attention on what I'm saying. This is the hardest thing to get people through who have been churched all their life because they're so used to the mentality of church. I go to church. I sing songs. I hear a sermon. I, I give my tithes. But they leave and still don't know who they are. They still don't have an identity. They don't see this as a family. They just think that they're saved. They're a survivor. And how well can I serve to try to please God? That is not the mentality of Christianity. The mentality of Christianity is that you begin to receive your identity as a son or daughter of God. Amen. You have to begin to see yourself as a son and as a daughter and that you have a heavenly father who is not going to let you do without. I talked about this last week. Jesus said, why are you worried about what you're going to eat and drink and put on? What you're going to wear? Don't you know that your father knows that you have need of all of these things? But yet you spend all your time, your mental energy, worrying. The father already knows what you need. My children rarely, rarely open the pantry and see nothing. My children don't go in their closet and think I have nothing to put on. <coughs> they wake up every day knowing that when they walk down them stairs, there's cereal, there's pancakes, there's food to eat. They're not worried about it. They don't sit up in their bed thinking, how, you know why? Because they don't have a fatherless, they don't have an orphan mentality. Mm -hmm. They don't have that mentality because they know that Father is going to provide. What does a Father do? A Father protects you, a Father provides for you, and a Father promotes you. Those are the three things that a Father does. He protects you because 
you know, with my children, sometimes when they're growing up, they get, they get scared. They get scared at night, scared in the dark. Something's going to get me up there, Daddy. Some of my older brothers told me about the boogeyman. You saw him last night, right? The boogeyman, Doug? <laughs> I'm your boogeyman. When my son comes down the stairs and he says, I'm afraid. I say, son, what do you have to be afraid of? I'm here. Do you think that I'm going to let anyone in this home and hurt you? I will, I will throw everything that I am and have at them to protect you. I'm going to protect you. Don't you have this mentality about, don't you believe that your father is going to protect you? Maybe you didn't have that mentality of a father being a protector or a provider. You may have had a deadbeat dad, I don't know. There are people that don't have the concept, the right concept of a father. All you got to do is visit the prison. That's all you got to do. Why would Jesus tell us to go to the prisons? Because it's like, 90, it's like 97, 98% of people in prison don't have or know who their father is. That's right. The story I hear is when they are going to give out Mother's Day cards that all the prisoners line up. When they give out Father's Day cards, nobody shows up because most of them don't know who their father is or either they don't have a relationship with their father. What, what is going on here? I just talked with someone recently that's talking about the epidemic. They just came from Los Angeles and the, the epidemic that's going on in, in, in L.A. with homelessness. Skid Row, have y'all seen it? It's so bad. It's so bad that the city has hired a homeless official that all that this lady does is she goes around and checks to see and make sure that people are not dead on the street. The, the rat population has become so bad in Los Angeles that they're saying it's at bu bu bubonic proportions. That they believe there's 30 rats per human on the streets. And these aren't little ones. They're big ones. I know a gentleman that said he met her because he went to minister to the homeless people. And go look it up. You, I mean, it's lined up, down, even down Beverly Hills. you got mansions, and you got just rows and scores of people. You can't even walk down the sidewalks. He said he had the opportunity to talk to her, and he said, why are all these homeless people here? Why? Where did they come from? And what's wrong with all these people? She said, I'm going to tell you something you're not going to believe it when I tell you. She said, because I deal with these people every day. She said, over 90% of them don't have a father. That breaks my heart. She said, many of these people, they may have been successful people, made a bad mistake, got in financial trouble, lost all that they had, but they didn't have anybody to fall back on. They didn't have a father to fall back on. So you don't understand when God created the family, he created a structure of support for people. But here's the whole deal. You have to choose to be a son. You have to choose to be, that's why I've been talking to you, what's the difference in being a son and being a begotten son? Abraham had two sons, but the Bible says he only had one. Then Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son. Ishmael was Abraham's son too, right? But the Bible doesn't say he was. He was the son of a bondwoman. He didn't have the mentality of Abraham. Abraham's having a conversation with God, and he says, I have all this stuff. Who am I going to leave it to? Am I going to leave it to my servant? He has a servant's mentality. That's why I'm talking about Genesis 18 and 19. God said, I know Abraham that he will raise his family after him, his household, and he will command his children. Why? Because Abraham, had, he's called the father of our faith. He's a father. We call him Father Abraham. He's the father of our faith. I got so much more I can go with this, but I'm going to stop with this today because we have to understand that in the, the foundation of a family, 
not just the ideals and concept, but when you become a part of a family, you understand that this family has a culture, it has ideals, and it's here that you receive an identity. In your family, you receive an identity. In your family, you receive an identity. You are going to have a natural, listen to what I'm telling you here. Jesus had a natural family, but he was not, he didn't relate to them anymore. They're standing outside. They're standing outside. Mary had to come into this. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mary had to come into this. Not all of Jesus' brothers came in. Many of them didn't believe that he was who he was. But Jesus sat there and looked at those that were following in him and he said, this is my family. This is my mother. This is my brother. Jesus was not creating church members. Let me say those things and then I'm going to stop. Because I need you to understand this today. Church does not portray family to us in the earth. What the church has portrayed to us is members and pews and numbers and structures and programs and priests and prayers and performances and entertainment and institu institutions and ministries and pastors and preachers. It has not, the church has not conveyed the idea of a family. If you take the whole idea of family out of Christianity, all you're left with is a religion. Did you just catch what I just said? If you want to know what religion is, make it void of family. That's why the, the world does not see a need to go to church because they can get religion anywhere. They can turn on a TV and get religion. They can get a message on TV. They can hear a preacher preach on TV. They can go to a, a mega church and hide. But when you, you but they don't still don't have a father. They don't have a mother. They don't have someone that they're in a relationship that will tell them when they're wrong. They don't have... This is the whole problem. You can't correct anybody in the church any, anymore. You know why? Because all we have is the mentality of brothers and sisters and servants. You don't have the mentality of a father. This is why you'll never walk in any more faith. Because you have to receive the structure of authority. Well, this is hard to push through in this area. Because this area is very religious. This is a religious, the, the, the south of America is one of the hardest, and I mean even one of the hardest places, which is my hometown. The Bible even tells me that a prophet, he can't do much in his own hometown. I'm not only trying to push through religion, I'm trying to push through familiarity. Oh yeah, I know Todd. Yeah, I know him. Know him all the way. That familiarity will blind people to where they cannot recognize who you are. Jesus' own brothers couldn't receive him. Why? Because they were familiar with him. That's the one fallacy with family is they become familiar and they don't see you for who you are. And when you don't recognize somebody as who they are, you do not receive what they have. That's why Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? You are the Son of God. And he said, Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter. The Father revealed it to you. That you have to receive. If you don't recognize when you don't recognize this, this is why I talk about when you don't recognize the new season, you can't enter it. If you don't recognize what God is doing in this season, you can't enter it. You have to understand that you are a vital part of this. You may look around and you may just see a handful of people. Bam. Jesus had 12. Jesus didn't need no more. 
You don't need 70. You don't need 120. Y'all better hear me when I'm telling you. Abraham didn't need but one son. That's all it took. All it takes is one. God didn't have to send angels and a whole plan. He sent his only son. And one person changed. That's how important you are in the family. That's how important you are in the family. It only takes one. It only takes one. Uh, the only thing that you, you, you need to make this your goal. That you grow up. That you be a good son or daughter. That you understand how to be a good son or daughter because that's what makes you a good mother or father. That's my goal. That's my whole plight. That's my whole ambition is just to be a good son. Why? Because in being a good son, I'm going to understand how to father. Because the whole goal here is for you to reproduce. You've got to reproduce. That's the glory of a grandfather. That's the glory of a grandmother. Proverbs tells us that the gray head is glorious in his grandchildren. I can't wait till my kids have grand, bring, bring them on. Bring them on, I'm going to spoil them and send them back home with you. Why? Because grandparents ain't got to raise them. But that's the problem we have in society now. We got grandmothers and great grandmothers raising children. And it's out of order. Why? Because God instituted that mother and father. I don't have a problem telling anybody this. If you're an aunt or an uncle, you may be an influence. But it's not your job to raise them. Now some people are put in a situation, some children, you know, they had to, somebody had to adopt them or foster them or whatever. But ultimately it falls on the father and mother. It's their responsibility. You may grow, have grown up and didn't have proper mothering or fathering. It'll show up in your life. It always does. It always does. What has to happen here is you have to receive, you have to begin to receive a spiritual family. Because that's the order that you're in now. Because all your family ain't born again. I'm sure they ain't. They might be. I hope they are. I'm trying to get. <laughs> God didn't make a promise that me and my whole household would be saved. Well, as for me, this whole household will be saved. I can't speak for them. I can't speak for, for them. But you have chosen to listen to me, and I can't speak for you. I can't speak for anybody that doesn't listen to me. If, if somebody doesn't listen to me, I can't help them. I can't help them. Stop wasting your time with people that ain't listening to you. You've got... To find those who will listen first. All right, I'm going to close Philip 